So now that we've established that self-interest is a very, very, very important facet of social order, let's look at some of the aspects of our social context that might influence us to act either in a self-interested way that's enlightened or selfish. So we're going to begin with what economists call games. Games are situations where there's no clear authority. Sometimes people are actually disagreeing about who the authority is. That's actually what makes it into a game. Where the authority is not a central player. Let me give you a little background here. A lot of economists, which is where all this stuff is coming from, self-interest and games, um, a lot of economists argue that the problem with the world is authority. <laughs> a lot of economists believe that our economic system would run extremely smoothly if there was no or very little government intervention into the economy. And it's the government that makes the problems. So economists have basically developed a whole theoretical toolkit for looking at situations where there's no authority, which is the situation they believe will create social order. They say get rid of authority and let sort of games and supply and demand and these sort of mechanisms create social order. So let's look at some games. Well, we played a game to start off this class. It was called The Prisoner's Dilemma. So you might be saying to yourself, why were we doing that? Why are we talking about prisoners and cops and interrogation rooms? Well, what I want to point out to you is the prisoner's dilemma is about cooperation. Either the criminals are cooperating with each other or the, or the criminals are co cooperating with the police. And we're studying social order, which is about cooperation. So I want to ask you, how many times in your life or in the lives of your friends or family do we achieve the worst outcome because we tried to take the course of action that was the best, best in quotes, best for our self, the selfish strategy, rather than a course of action that was best for the group, which is a pro-social strategy. The prisoner's dilemma captures that because if you answer the question, which outcome is worse for the individual? Which outcome is worse for the group? Which outcome is best for the individual? Which outcome is worse for the group? You'll start to realize that the, the strategy that's going to get you, you know, zero years in prison, which is to tell the cops that your friend did it, is the same strategy that's going to get you in jail for 25 years. The best strategy when you're dealing with the police and a crime, whether you did it or you didn't do it, is keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and a lot of my students know this, and I'm very impressed. I think it's because they've watched a lot of television. But you keep your mouth shut. That's the best strategy for both of you. You might do some time, but it's better than turning against your partner. So here are some other examples where games are relevant. Marriage. Think about this for a moment. Is there an authority in marriage? A lot of men might try to claim that they're the authority, but in today's world where men and women are equals, men and women will get into fights in their marriage. I disagree with my wife, we'll argue with each other. And it would be really nice if we could turn to somebody and say, listen, you've heard us arguing with each other, and uh, who's right? You tell us. And, you know, imagine there was this third party in my marriage that listened to us fight, and the person said, you know what, Mike's right, Sarah's wrong. And then Sarah, my wife, Sarah, would just have to keep her mouth shut and say, okay, Mike's right, the judge said Mike's right, and, and I'm wrong, so I'm going to say I'm wrong. But our marriage isn't like that. Our marriage is a relationship between two equals, and it actually makes it more difficult because there's no authority there to say who's right and who's wrong. You have to settle it through negotiation with each other. What about parenting? Now you might say, oh, the parents the authority. Well, kind of. Kids really don't understand authority, particularly young kids. They don't understand that. They're, it's, it's not a good appeal to say to your children, well, I'm the authority. Your child's three years old, they're gonna say, really? Hmm, I don't really understand that concept. So you've got a game there where the child feels like they're an equal. Now you can try to beat the crap out of your kid and explain to them that you're 
bigger than them and badder than them, but that doesn't seem to work. So rather than seeing it as I'm the authority and you're not, maybe our parenting situations are better viewed as games. What about, I'm going to jump down to civil wars. Civil wars are fund fundamentally about who is the authority. But at the same time, what I want to point out about civil wars is it would be in the best interest of everybody involved in a civil war if everybody put their guns down and got a job and got married and lived happily ever after, right? What would you choose? To live in a civil war situation where, you know, my uncle killed your uncle and my grandfather killed your grandfather and my brother killed your brother and everyone's dying and this has been going on for generations after generations. For those of you who don't know, there's lots of countries around the world where civil wars have been going on for decades. Uh, my family is actually from one of them in uh, Colombia where all the heroin and cocaine comes from. They've been in civil war for hundreds of, well, a hundred years. Ideally, in that situation, the two parties involved would put their guns down. That's the best strategy for everyone. But they don't want to do that. <laughs> a lot of them are pursuing the selfish strategy. You killed my grandfather, so now I'm going to kill you. You killed my brother, so now I'm going to kill you. That's selfish. That's thinking about yourself. That's not thinking about the group as a whole. The other aspect that's important about civil wars is it's a lot like a prisoner's dilemma. If my side says that they're going to put their guns down, we're going to put our guns down, we want peace. You know what the other side's probably going to do? Come murder them, just massacre them completely. Do you understand that? If side A put their guns down and said, yes, we want peace, side B might come over and kill them all because that's what they want to do. What about buying consumer goods on the internet? Same thing. Who is the, who's the authority? Is it the seller, the person selling the object, or is it the person who's buying it, the consumer? Well, if I want to, I could, you know, go on to Amazon.com, say that I've got some sociology book, you can send me a $70 check, and I could send you you know, a totally different book. Take your money and send you a totally different book. Now, I just chose the selfish strategy. I lied, cheated, and stealed, stole, <laughs> and I got $70 and you got a piece of crap. That's not ideal. Now, this is a prisoner's dilemma situation because what if I want to sell another book and then I want to sell another book and then I want to sell another book? The idea here is that if I keep on pursuing the selfish strategy, Eventually, it's going to come back and bite me in the ass. But if I start to develop a more pro-social strategy where I send you the book you want, you send me money, that's good for both of us, you win, I win, we're going to get a better outcome. What we're going to do is look at two types of games. I've already been alluding to both of them. The first one is called a zero-sum game. You've probably heard of this called the winner-take-all this idea is that the amount of winnable goods is fixed. Whatever one actor gains, the other actor loses. So if we're talking about um, civil war, well, if I kill you and take all your money, well, you can't have that person back and you can't have the money. You've just lost that. That's a winner-take-all situation. If I bring a pizza pie to class and I say, there's eight slices, whoever wants one can have one. Well, everyone that gets a slice of pizza gets a slice of pizza. Everyone who doesn't does not. This is pure competition. Whatever is gained by one person is lost by another. So I want you to think about why this type of game might produce social disorder. Have you thought about it? What usually happens in these situations is because the competition is so fierce, if I don't get a job if you get the job, I don't get the job. If you get food, I don't get food. If the situation is bad enough, in a winner-take-all situation, it's going to lead to internal states like anger and fear and anxiety and panic. And those types of emotions tend to breed behaviors that are violent, that um, behaviors that are unethical, like maybe I'll lie, cheat, or steal to get what I need because 
I am being motivated by panic, fear, and anger. So a winner-take-all situation can very much devolve to, into social disorder. Whenever I teach this in class, there's some intelligent student out there who says, Mike, I'd like to point out that every single sport is a zero-sum game, where one football team wins and one football team loses. One baseball team wins, one baseball team loses. So the question becomes, how is it that sporting events are zero-sum games, and yet sporting events are usually, usually socially ordered? And we talk about this in class, and the solution we usually come up with is this. First, most sporting events have a system of rules that everyone agrees upon. We know what the rules are. We know that we know what a touchdown is. We know what a first down is. We know what's um, clipping. We know what's an acceptable hit. We know all of these rules. Shared meanings. We all know what a football game is. A football game is something to go and to be entertained and to have fun. It's about sportsmanship. We have a whole meaning system that justifies the winning and the losing. A good football game is not one where one team scores 100 points and the other team scores zero. In my mind, a good football game is, you know, fourth quarter, two minutes left in the game, you know, one team's up by two points. A field goal will, will, will decide who wins, and it's an exciting game, and it's fought to the end. So part of a good sport is actually the meaning of good competition. Those aspects of that social situation override the zero-sum game. If we go on and we look at the other aspect of, of games, the other type of game, it's called a positive-sum game. It's a win-win scenario. In this situation, the players have an interest in common. So they want to achieve, achieve an outcome that works best for everyone involved. One actor benefits, but not necessarily through the other actor's loss. We're trying to create situations where we both win and neither one of us lose. The best course for each player is the best course for the team as a whole. So you should see a very, very strong affinity here between enlightened self-interest and positive sum games. You create positive sum games and then you create enlightened self-interest in people. They go hand in hand. Same thing in our marriages. Are we going to pursue situations where I win and you lose? That would be a zero-sum game. If you keep on creating those situations in your marriage, I win, you lose. I would predict if you keep on doing that over and over and over, you're probably going to get a divorce eventually because your partner keeps losing over and over and over. If you can create win-win situations where I get what I want, you get what you want, we're probably going to stay together. We figured out a way to cooperate. The clip I want to show you is a scene where the main character, a man named Nash, develops his theory of an equilibrium at a bar. Everything you're learning about positive sum games, win-win scenario, enlightened self-interest, all of this stuff is coming from this movie, The Nash Equilibrium. Um, this is a real, you know, theory. This is a true story about a man named Nash.